Eric Fisher is a Pluralsight author with over 15 years of experience in software development. He has also worked in outreach for underrepresented groups for a bit over a decade, including those with accessibility needs. A perfect segue into tonight's topic, I think. So take it away, Eric. All right, hello everyone. Um, we're just like to go ahead is, as I mentioned, any questions you have, feel free to put them in the chat or queue up if you wanna hop on camera and raise your hand if you're comfortable, all that's fine. I do appreciate having this as a discussion as opposed to me just talking at you, but whichever's fine. So before we can go really into how we're dealing with accessibility and technology, first we should kind of set the ground of what exactly is accessibility. And if we look at the definitions, we'll end up seeing three common definitions. The quality of being easy to approach, reach, enter, speak with, use, or understand. The quality of being usable, reachable, or obtainable. And the quality of being suitable or adapted for use with people with disabilities. Now, the good news is when we're talking about accessibility and technology, no matter which of these we're trying to address, we are going to address all three. So all three definitions are applicable to us, but the point is we're trying to make our software usable by more people, inclusive of those with disabilities. The next thing that becomes a concern of, you know, how important this is, is how big of a concern is accessibility? And we have, Three common myths that come up that will commonly be used as excuses of why not to do accessibility. The first one being accessibility only helps a small subset of users. The second being we don't need accessibility as we don't have any users with accessibility concerns. And the last being we are not legally obligated to make our products accessible. So the first two is kind of a expense cost analysis of if I put in this work, am I going to get my return on that? Versus the last one is strictly, if I don't have to, I'm not going to. And again, these are all myths. So the first myth we're gonna tackle is that accessibility only helps a small subset of users. And one thing I'm going to point out before I start presenting statistics is some of these statistics are a little bit old because there's a delay on when you get a lot of the accessibility statistics. So I tried to use things like the US population at the time those statistics were presented. So based on those statistics, the population of the United States of America at this time would have been about 331.5 million people. If we were to look at this, how many of the people within the United States do we believe deal with accessibility problems on a regular basis? And I do wanna preface this by saying, I'm not strictly talking about individuals with disabilities in this question. Now, is it 331.5 million, so literally everyone? 215 million, 122 million, 61 million. All right. So those who want to respond, you can take a moment, but then I'm going to move on because I've got a lot to cover. But uh, it looks like we have C. And the answer is actually literally every single person alive deals with accessibility problems on a regular basis. Um, whether you're wearing glasses, or you walk outside and you're holding your phone and it's in the sun and you can't see because there's a big glare on your screen, or you just exited a movie theater and it's bright outside and you can't see, or you bang your hand and now you have to have like a splint on it. People deal with accessibility. It affects literally everyone. The difference is for some people, it is a constant issue they have to deal with that can be insurmountable for them if you haven't handled it appropriately. So that brings on the next question. Ignoring the people who just have accessibility as a come and going type problem, how many people do we believe in the United States of America have been diagnosed, that is they've actually had a medical professional say you have this condition that is legally protected? And again, I have the same statistics for that. And rather than just waiting, I'm just going to keep going forward. And the answer on this particular one is it's about 61 million have been diagnosed as having a legally protected disability. This comes out to be roughly 26% of adults. And if you actually look at those numbers, the math doesn't work out because there's two different sources for those information. That's unfortunate the reality with dealing with 
accessibility statistics is, we're really bad at recording those. So we're talking at this point, ah, we're talking at this point that our subset of individuals that we supposedly say is too small to worry about is either literally every single person who lives and breathes or about one in four people, which I don't care what you're using as a measurement, 26% is not a small subset. Now, the next thing that comes up is we don't have any users with accessibility concerns. And while I could certainly point back at that last slide and say, yes, you do, because if you have more than 10 customers, realistically, at least two of them are probably legally disabled. But let's take into consideration our product. If we make a product or service that is a absolutely miserable experience to unusable by someone with an accessibility concern, such as a disability, what is the likelihood that they are going to buy or subscribe to that product? It's going to be pretty close to zero. No one's going to willingly do that unless they have literally no other choice. Or if we want a more tangible version of this, imagine, for example, we have a pizzeria that is at the top of a stairwell, and it's understandably inaccessible for wheelchair users. Understandably, we probably wouldn't have any wheelchair customers in that pizzeria. Now, certainly the owner of the pizzeria could make the argument that, well, we have no wheelchair customers, why would we build a handicap ramp to serve our zero wheelchair customers? But this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. By being inaccessible, you won't have people with accessibility concerns as customers most of the time. Basically, it's problematic within itself, which is why people won't use it. Now, the last one comes from the legal side of it. And I'm going to preface this by saying I am not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. If you want legal advice, talk to a lawyer. The information I'm presenting here is intended to demonstrate that you likely have legal obligations regarding accessibility that you may not be aware of. Now, when we're talking about legal as far as software, Generally, we're going to be speaking about the American Disabilities Act, or the ADA, signed in 1990, and specifically the section known as Title III. Uh, pretty much this boils down to dealing with public accommodations, which I'll, this is like the actual verbatim here, which is Title III prohibits the discrimination on the basis of disability in activities of places of public accommodations and requires newly constructed or altered places of public accommodations, such as commercial, to comply with ADA standards. Don't worry if that didn't make sense. We're dealing with legalese. The point of this is saying, okay, we require you to make our, like to make your areas reasonably accommodatable to people with disabilities, and that's places of public accommodation. Now, based on the AADA, a place of public accommodation includes just about every business in existence is considered a place of public accommodation at this point. In addition to that, there in the full written law, there's a section that specifically says one of the requirements is computer software is accessible which based on recent court cases, and I'm saying recent in the last 20 years, has come to include websites and mobile applications. So I'm not gonna go into all the specifics on this particular case, but let's talk about Domino's. Domino's had a website that was designed in such a way that it was unusable with accessibility tools, such as screen readers. And so what ended up happening with Domino's is there was a potential customer who came in attempting to order a pizza. They were unable to do so due to the lack of accessibility and ultimately filed a Title III complaint against Domino's. Now, while Domino's won the first part of that case, basically saying making things accessible is too vague, there's all these hurdles and all that kind of stuff, ultimately it got appealed and the individual won that it was a Title III violation and they got a payout and Domino's was required to take corrective action. That they found that being vague about what's required and all of that is not an excuse. Um, they attempted to take it to a Supreme Court appeal, and the Supreme Court said, absolutely not. And what was so important about this particular case is it set precedent that the ADA applies to places of service, not necessarily to service in places of public accommodation. And that effectively opened it up so every single website and mobile application would qualify under this. I will put an asterisk on this, that there are exceptions with the ADA, like if your company is small enough, and a few other exceptions that 
how the law applies to you is different. But the point is, if you have a website that's doing any type of business, there's a good chance the ADA applies to you in some level. Now, Domino's wasn't an exception here. They weren't the only company who got in trouble for this. I'm gonna give you a quick list of just a number of companies who either lost or settled out of court over violating the Title III. And I'm not gonna go through them all. These are just a number of big names that got hit. And the point is, this is not an exhaustive list. It is not even a remotely exhaustive list. It doesn't include ongoing litigation or stuff that just never reached the public eye. The point is, Title III violations are a big deal that we have to be careful about. So naturally, the next question would come, all right, we have this legal obligation, it's impacting a lot of our users, and we wanna get these customers that we can't get right now because our product is not usable by them. So how do we fix this? And the first thing I'll say is, there's the World Wide Web Consortium, that's the W3C, has a standard called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or the WCAG. And this works in a way where there's A level, AA level, and AAA level. And generally speaking, whether you're using web application, mobile application, or desktop application, you want to adhere to the standard to at least the AA level. While the AA level doesn't guarantee you won't have any ADA complaints because you could use, you know, perhaps particularly hostile language or stuff of that nature not covered in this that could still result in ADA problems. The good news is this means your web application will work with accessibility tools, which are what most of those companies I had just listed got in trouble for. So now we're gonna go into actually actionable things we can do, things to consider and actually move forward in, you know, more than talking why this is important. And we'll start with visual impairments because that's one of the most common ones you run into and one of the most common ones you'll get in trouble for. And we'll start with some statistics on showing how widespread this problem is. Within the United States of America, roughly 1.3 million people over the age of 40 are legally blind. About 4.2 million people over the age of 40 are visually impaired, which means they're not quite to the point of fully blind, but they're visually impaired enough that they would qualify with disability. 150 million people wear corrective lenses to see. And if we remember that our initial statistic was about 330 million, that's just shy of half the population uses corrective lenses. And to talk about the nature of how everyone is impacted by accessibility, temporarily roughly 1 million people a year will be blinded due to eye infection from contact lenses. I'm sorry if I've terrified anyone who uses contact lenses. The point of that is these are people who can normally see who will be temporarily blinded in a year. And I have tried to make sure to include sources on all of these statistics for anyone who wants to go and look into them more. And so the first thing I'm gonna tell you is to adhere to the WCAG AA level, and I am going to bring this up on literally every single accessibility concern because it's that important. But let's talk about things that are both included and not included in that to try and give you more stuff. So the first thing I'm going to do here is we talked about accessibility tools and that this is one of the things that people got in trouble for was not being able to use these tools. So it's probably worth taking a second to actually look at an example. And hopefully the volume on my system is not too loud because I'm going to turn on a screen reader to demonstrate on a website that is correctly designed to handle a screen reader and one that is poorly designed. And it will be obnoxious and I apologize, but I need to do it to get a point across. So we should be looking at, yep. So I've got this application up and this is the website that is correctly designed for a screen reader. So I'm going to turn that on, at which point I'm not gonna be able to talk much because it's not going to be quiet. But the way a screen reader works is it will read on your screen. The old school ones will just read from the top left to the bottom right. Whereas the more modern ones are far more sophisticated, can move between landmarks and the page and headers, and you can use voice dictation and all sorts of stuff. That is not what I wanted. I have no idea what just happened. Oh, oh, I know what this feature is. I do not know how to get that back. I, I'm not gonna ask questions, I'm just gonna go with that. All right, so we had the screen reader. I hit the wrong shortcut key, this is what I wanted.
So on this website, now ideally when I'm trying to navigate around, I can use what's known as landmarks. It allowed me to hop around the page very quickly. And this is very useful for people with voice dictation or visibility problems. So I'm going to start by trying to jump between landmarks on this page. So you can see I can ably, very easily hop between different components on this page that would allow me to drill in and out of stuff very easily for someone who has a visual impairment. I don't have to actually be able to see this page in any meaningful manner to navigate because I was able to reach like the navigation pane and go, oh, that's navigation, at which point I'd be able to say and you know actually have it read everything out. I'm not gonna do it because it takes forever. I, I can also jump between headers as well. So this is basically how this tool works when things are set up correctly. But now let me switch to a page that's set up improperly and show you just how rough it is. Now, if you remember in the last page, it's able to jump between landmarks. Now, listen what happens when I try and do that on this page. I, I assume this is actually reading out and you guys can hear me and you're not just hearing silence for this because that would be very unfortunate. Now, it's not finding anything. Oh, we can't hear the screen reader? Well, that's a bummer. So what happened on the previous one is when I was hopping between these, sorry, it's talking. So when it's hopping through here, it's actually reading out litany of keyboards, you know, header one. And when I hit D, it'll say, hey, you're looking at the banner landmark, the header, or the navigation landmark. So Cool, it'll tell you what you're jumping between, then you can have it read that. Now what's happening here, is when I try and jump between the landmarks, it's just yelling at me, no next landmark, no next landmark. It doesn't know how to get around. And I can still hop between the headers. And at this particular page, it's still kind of usable, but on an actually complicated page where you'd have like asides and footers and more elaborate navigation, none of that would work. Now, it's okay that you guys don't hear the screen reader like I really wish you had, but I'm not gonna fight with the tooling here. But the point was between these two pages, one I could navigate and have it read easily, and the other one is basically unusable for that purpose. Now, to go into why that actually is, if we look at down here near the bottom, this is your developer tools on your website. And there's specifically under the elements section an accessibility tree. And this is effectively what accessibility tools can see and use. Now, on our page that can't work well with our accessibility tools, you'll notice this is effectively just a list of all the elements in the page without any context about where they are or what they do or what they mean. And if we look at the way the page is implemented, it's using a bunch of divs for organizing its structure. This is a very, very popular strategy from like 2005 to like 2012 ish before HTML5 really started taking off. Now, there's lots of websites still implementing this way and they do not work with accessibility tools properly. There is some fuzziness you can get them to work with, but generally it's not a good experience. Now, if you look at the page that's implemented properly with consideration of development tools and we look at its accessibility tree, we'll notice something very different. You're going to notice I have a banner, a main, a content info. I can drill in here, it'll tell me I have a header and navigation. There's a very rigid structure to it. And these are the different points I'm able to jump between using my screen reader. When we're looking at the way this is implemented, it's because I'm using semantic HTML, where I actually say, this is my header, this is my navigation, this is my main, I have sections in here. And these are the things that these accessibility tools use. Now, for people who are using desktop applications and mobile application development, you have a lot of these functionalities in those platforms as well, but depending on whether you're on iOS or Android, or you're making a UWP application, whatever it is you're producing, they'll have their own sets of APIs to expose stuff out to accessibility tools, and you'll want to use whatever those are for your respective platforms. All right. Go ahead and get this started again, wherever it disappeared to from current slide. Cool. It switched on me again, so I'll switch that again. All right, cool. So 
The point of that is to make sure you're implementing your application appropriately for whatever technology you're using for the accessibility APIs. With web dev, it's nice and simple. You use semantic HTML and that takes percent of, takes care of a lot of it. There are um, additional tags and all that you can implement to go farther, but that's kind of outside of the scope of this talk simply because that would be what I would do if I was strictly talking on web applications. Now, screen readers aren't the only accessibility tool out there. You have stuff like um, voice dictation tools, you have refreshable braille, refreshable braille displays, and there are many other tools out there, but the point is they all use that same accessibility tree to function. If that accessibility tree isn't properly there, the tools aren't going to work right. And the screen readers will also work with like PowerPoint and all those other things. Now, the next thing you can do so far as visual impairment is to make sure you support whatever system fonts and text resizing the user has put in place. When we go into stuff like Windows and Android and all of these different operating systems, we can actually go in and say, you know, I don't want your default font. Instead, I want Calibri or Arial or Comic Sans or whatever I choose. And I want to make it 150% its size because that's going to make it easier to read. You want to make sure your application respects that. If the user has gone out of their way to set these, you need to hit the APIs for your respective platform and say, hey, they set their zoom to 200% on their fonts. That's what I should do in my application. Now, I do understand that creates some difficulty in creating application layouts and UIs and all that, but that's kind of the thing you have to focus on when dealing with accessibility. It's also worth taking the time in your application to provide a place within your application specifically to increase the font size in your application. That could be under a setting page or directly in line, but the point is if someone needs their font to be bigger, you should let them do that as best you can. Um, it's fine to support things over 200% zoom, but you want to support at least two 200% zoom. The next important thing with visual impairment is having a decent contrast. Now, ideally you want to have that contrast be at least seven to one for just normal text, and 4.5 to 1 for larger scale text. That would be up to the WCAG AAA standard. Um, the big reason why this is a thing that you deal with with visual impairments is a lot of times, especially on mobile devices, you can deal with less than ideal lighting, i.e. that situation where you're standing outside, you're staring at your phone, and the sun is just glaring on it, which means you're going to have a great deal of difficulty seeing that screen. The more contrast, the more you do to try and make stuff pop out, the far easier it's going to be to work around that, that aggravation. Now I could go into how you actually calculate and figure out what your contrast is, but it is a ridiculous equation that takes literal minutes to figure it out and involves all sorts of math that I'm not going to pretend to fully understand. Instead, just use a calculator. I have a preference for the webaim.org resources contrast checker. And even though there are far more feature rich calculators out there, the reason why I like this one specifically is if you look at the bottom of where it has that preview on the screen, you'll notice it mentions WCAG AA pass, WCAG AAA pass. It is explicitly telling you, hey, this meets the standard or better. So it's just very helpful to go about doing it that way. The next thing with visual impairment that might seem a little weird to have included here is for allow keyboard use only. And I want to make sure to specify, I'm not saying you should only support keyboard. I'm saying you can support all the devices you want, but I should be able to use your entire application using only my keyboard if I so wish. Now, there's a couple things that go into handling that. One is that when it comes to the navigation of your website, I need to be able to navigate using a keyboard. One of the things that becomes notoriously bad about this is when we're talking about drop down menus for navigation. Like if you remember your old context menus, the old school ones, you could use your arrow keys and hop through them, but modern browser ones and mobile application ones often require where you'd click on it and you have to hold on it. If you let go, it goes away, it becomes a problem. And for those on mobile who are thinking that the keyboard situation doesn't apply to them, it does. There are a lot of people with accessibility problems who will plug keyboards into their phone to use it as an accessibility need. So you do need to support that if you can. Now, the next one that comes up is what's known as a keyboard trap, which is an interface component that allows you to navigate into it using a keyboard, but you cannot get back out of it using a keyboard. 
And these aren't super common nowadays, especially if you're using whatever controls are built in your operating system for stuff like calendars and all that. But a lot of times when you get into stuff like custom controls for calendars, that's where you run into problems. The person goes to the calendar control, they hit tab to get to it, the calendar window pops up, everything fades out in the background, and then they're hitting the arrow keys and nothing are happening. They're hitting tab, nothing's happening. And their only choices are to hit F5 to refresh the page or to Alt F4 the desktop application close because they are now trapped, unable to use your application because they popped into this. It's not super common, but when it runs into it, it 100% ends accessibility at that moment. The next thing to do, which seems pretty straightforward, is to make sure your tab order is logical. Most websites, this happens automatically. A lot of web applicate, or sorry, a lot of web form or similar desktop UIs, this happens automatically, where it's basically top left, working your way down, the tab order makes sense. But especially if you're doing kind of funky stuff with your layouts by rearranging stuff in weird ways, or if you, for example, in web dev, use float left or anything like that, you can get some weird places where your tab order is all over the place that you have to manually set it. But let's make sure your tab order makes sense. The next thing is any type of active input you have, make sure it's very visible and easy to see where you are in the page. In our example down here, I've got first name, last name, and state. Very clearly, you can see that the last name has been highlighted, that if I were to start typing, that's where it would show up. It's important to have that for people with visual impairments. One thing I should have mentioned earlier is visual impairment doesn't mean blind. It doesn't mean I can't see anything. It's I can't see well enough to use this without assistance. Another thing to consider is accessibility with your layouts. This is a major concern when you're dealing with web applications on phones and mobile devices in general. And that's stuff like making sure your controls are easy to reach holding a phone one-handed, whether that's the left or the right hand. And generally this means you need to have your controls in reach of your thumbs when holding your phone. This means near the bottom along the sides. Now, one thing I'll point out is if you have to stretch or it's on your limitation on like the extent of what you can reach with your thumb, you should consider it out of reach since people have different mobility in their hands, different lengths of fingers and all that. This can be a really difficult to work around, especially when you're considering the two-handed side of it. But the point is if you don't do this, you can have problems where people cannot use your phones. And this is a visual concern just because of how a, a lot of phones are mounted onto wheelchairs and such. You should also make sure your layouts are consistent. A very common thing that will happen with people with visual impairments is they're going to have to zoom in on your screen a huge amount. They're not going to really get in there. And when they do that, the problem you run into is if they cannot figure out or predict where your navigation is going to be and have to do the whole hunt and search, it kind of boils down to, them dragging their screen left to right along the top, they don't see it, so they scroll down and drag back to the left to check under the banner. And if they don't see it, they'll drag down the left side. And it becomes an incredibly tedious thing. Meanwhile, even if your navigation's out of the way, if I get to it the first time and I reach it, I know on the very next page to go straight there for the navigation. So you want to be consistent about it. Another thing, which this goes into marketing as much as accessibility, is anything that is important on your page should be above the fold, above the point I have to scroll. Otherwise, it could be very difficult for an individual with accessibility concern to reach it in a meaningful manner. This is especially true of any controls you're going to add on your application for consideration with accessibility. Let's say, for example, you were forward thinking and said, hey, you know what? We're going to put a font size thing up here. We're going to put a zoom up here. We're going to put stuff that, you know, We'll disable the rotation of your screen, and we're going to put all of that on here, but you put it on the bottom right corner of the page. They have to manage to scroll all the way bottom to reach that accessibility, which means it might be unreachable for them to begin with. The point is, stuff like the title, navigation, you know, any important details should be right near the top, so you do not have to scroll to reach them. Another thing on top of that is to respect whatever screen orientation the user has. Again, this is primarily a mobile consideration. If a user has their screen in portrait mode, you should not change their screen to landscape mode unless explicitly letting them know and having that. And one of the reasons for this is if, for example, I am sitting in a wheelchair, I might have my phone 
physically mounted on my wheelchair where I cannot rotate it. It's locked in place. As such, if I open your application and I switch screens and suddenly the screen rotates, I can't turn the screen to put it back. You've now put me in an awkward position. As such, if you do have a screen you absolutely cannot present in one of the two modes, you need to have a way to back out of it that should be very reachable, very easy to access. It's also worth noting, if you're using the operating system's built-in screen rotation, a lot of times the user can go into their system settings and disable that rotation to help prevent that from being a problem. So you should really use the system's built-in one. In addition to that, you want to make sure if you do switch the orientation of the screen, that that's exposed where accessibility tools can get at. The good news is most operating systems, if you're using their controls for rotating the screen, have that built in to already expose it so you don't have to do any additional work. But if you do some type of custom thing, you're going to have to do research on your APIs and how to tell the operating system to expose that information. Now, after visual impairments, the next one that comes up is hearing impairments. That is, people have difficulty hearing. When we're talking about statistics around hearing impairments within the United States, Roughly 14.6% of people over the age of 18 have some level of hearing difficulty. That goes up to 33% when we're at 65 plus and 50% when we're talking 75 plus. This boils down to about 48 million people have hearing and balance problems. Now, you'll notice these two statistics kind of don't agree, and that's because they come from two different sources again. So they also equate to different years. That's going to happen a lot throughout here just because of the nature of trying to get these statistics. I have to go to multiple sources just to find them. So once again, adhere to the WCAG AA level. That's going to literally solve most of your problems. If there are two things you get out of this talk, the first thing is that accessibility is important, and the second thing is WCAG AA level, that should be your minimum bar to hit. Now the big one when we're talking about hearing disabilities is we're going to want to deal with any audio content. If it is audio content in nature, we want to have an alternative to that. So if I'm doing audio podcasts, what I want to do is have a written form of that podcast alongside it for those who can't hear. If I'm dealing with videos, then context starts to matter. If it makes sense, say I'm doing a one-on-one -on -one interview to have written out everything, do that. But there are a lot of cases that maybe that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, that you know it's a movie or something where the presentation of the imagery really matters. In that case, consider using subtitles. Now, a lot of subtitles are entered manually that make them really good, but there are also a lot of subtitles that are handled automatically, such as the one you're seeing on this presentation on the bottom of the screen. Now, the problem with a lot of these automatic voice-to-text thing is when we're looking at them, they're kind of a mixed bag. They don't handle poor audio quality well. They don't handle background noise well. People with particularly strong accents can be problematic to these tools. So you're going to want to verify the results. And you'll certainly see if you watch these subtitles, it does okay. Like one of the ones that comes up a lot is when I say double A, a lot of times, or AA, sometimes it'll say 88 instead. But there's lots of those kinds of problems. And that's really the only big one for hearing impairment that I'm going to go in with here. And again, WCAG has this whole thing that gets into all of this. But let's talk about speech impairments, of which point the first thing you might think is, but speech impairments? Like, what do I do in software that speech matters? Well, before I get into that, we'll go back into the statistics side of it. Now, one thing I want to point out when we're talking about speech impairments is they kind of come in two different categories. The first category is voice problems. That's your actual ability to produce sound that, you know, to speak. Roughly one point. 4% of children between the ages of 3 and 17 years old have voice problems. 7.6% of adults have voice problems. Now, when we look at language problems, which are a separate issue, that is, you can physically make the noise, but making words is hard, and communicating is difficult. So the muscles work, but it's actually getting, getting something that makes sense out. 3.3% of children between the ages of 3 and 17 have language problems. And unfortunately, I was not able to get a good statistic around adults because in the United States, we don't have an existing surveillance system for language problems in adults. However, 
I do have the statistic that roughly 2 million individuals have aphasia who are adults, which is a common symptom of stroke. So when you talk about individuals who have stroke who have slurred speech, inability to enunciate words, that's what you're talking about, and that is a common problem there. Again, adhere to the WCAG AA level. I am not joking that I'm going to bring this up every time because that's that important. We've already covered about allowing keyboard use only, and this is important when it comes to speech because a lot of systems will use voice dictation. You need to have an alternative. Which brings us on to the next slide, which is do not rely on voice dictation alone. You may certainly have voice dictation in your applications, but any functionality that is exposed by means of voice dictation, you should have a keyboard only and or other alternative ways of accomplishing that same functionality without voice dictation. The worst offenders for problems here are digital assistants. And this is just because of their nature of being voice dictated. Now, the good news is this problem isn't particularly widespread, mostly because having devices with decent microphones and decent acoustics has never been a particularly great thing in technology so far. So fortunately, people haven't relied on it. So more than likely, this isn't an issue a lot of you are going to be dealing with. After this, we get into limited motor function. Now, with limited motor function, you have a number of different things you got to deal with. One of the problems you're dealing with limited motor function is you don't typically sit there and say, hey, this is the percent of people with limited motor function. It's treated as a symptom of other conditions. So any statistics around it, you have to find those other conditions. But for example, Parkinson's disease affects one to 4% based on age group. We have dystonia is quarter million people. Uh, 10 million people have essential tremor, which is a shaking of the hands and such. Um, you have four point 5.4% of people have some form of paralysis. And you also have that limited motor function often co-occurs with neurodivergent conditions. And I'm going to kind of skip through that to make sure we have time because that specific statistic is actually from the UK because I couldn't find a good statistic from the US because we are really bad about recording neurodivergent conditions. Again, WCAG. Um, we get into the decent contrast, consider accessibility layouts, consider navigation, respect user orientation, all of those go into it which it makes perfect sense. If I have someone who has limited motor function, that is they have difficulty with their arms and hands and such, they're going to have a device mounted more than likely on say their wheelchair or whatnot. You're not going to be able to rotate the screen. So again, don't, don't, don't do that to them. The big thing with limited motor function that we haven't already covered is touch and device manipulation gestures. That is rotate the screen where you shake to make stuff disappear, you, you know, touch to zoom and all that kind of stuff. It's fine to have those, by all means have those. Make sure you have alternative ways to accomplish the same thing. Another thing you should also do is make it so you can disable that functionality, especially like shake to erase. If someone has a tremor, they're going to be very upset when they keep erasing things because your device keeps misreading it as I'm shaking it. So make sure you go in and have somewhere in there, it's like I have this feature, here's the setting to turn it off and have a keyboard way of doing it. There are a few manipulations that aren't easy to translate the keyboard, like again, the touch zoom onto a spot. Just do what you can. Now, the next one I wanna cover is a fairly common one you run to, which is color deficiency, which is often mistakenly called color blindness, to the point that I actually have been getting this wrong for years, calling it color blindness, and was only recently corrected by an optometrist who said, hey, you know, that isn't what you think it is. So, it's color deficiency, even in optometry books, they get it wrong, it's fine. If you say colorblind, people are gonna know what you're talking about. Now, the one thing I'm going to point out about color deficiency compared to all of the other things we've covered so far is while all of them have some level of variation between the genders, color deficiency is very, very biased in that it affects men at a much, much higher frequency than it does women. And it's one of the only conditions here that has such an extreme difference. And this boils down to the fact that red-green color blindness often comes attached with the X chromosome, and it is a recessive trait. Since men only get one X chromosome, if they have the trait on one, they have that color deficiency. Whereas women have two X chromosomes, it must be present on both of those chromosomes for that person to have that red-green deficiency, which makes it statistically way, way lower. 
When we're talking about color deficiency, about 4.5% of the population has some level of color deficiency, the most common being red-green deficiency, primarily because of what I just mentioned with that whole X chromosome thing. But you look here, you see the statistics. The one thing you'll notice is when it comes to the different types of color blindness, ignoring monochromancy, that generally they're within a fair margin of red-green color blindness so far as women to the blue-yellow and then men being higher in that red-green. But the point is, it's a common problem. Again, adhere to WCAG. The biggest things you can do when it comes into consideration of people who are color deficient is have a high contrast. That is the single most important thing you can possibly do here. If you do not have it, your stuff will be hard to read. It's even okay if you use colors that color deficient individuals tend to confuse red and green. It's fine if the contrast between those colors is far enough apart that they're not going to look the same. The second thing you run into is to never rely on color alone to communicate anything to the user. As I presented here, I have a bad okay and a good way of doing this. Bad, you'll see I am using exclusively color, which means a color deficient individual isn't going to be able to differentiate what's happening there. Okay, we've got symbolism here, and so long as those symbols are well understood, it's not that bad. You can get away with it. But in this case, like the check and the X certainly makes sense. That question mark, tenuous on what it means. And then the good is we presented it both with the symbol and with the written text. Understandably, that's not always a choice, but when possible, it is an excellent choice. Now, one thing I want to point out before I turn on a color deficient filter is if you notice this slide, there is one spot on the screen that's kind of not pleasant to look at, that your eye does kind of weird things. And it's that yellow dot, that if you look at that yellow dot, you're going to start noticing that the tan around it gets like this discoloration. And that's because in reality, that yellow dot is actually a very, very low contrast from that tan on the back. So your eyes are having to work extra hard to differentiate it. And you'll see that when I turn on my color filter. Now that I turn on a color filter that's simulating monochromancy, that's actual color blindness, that dot is still there if you really look carefully. But because of the lack of contrast, it's near impossible to see. You're also going to notice on the bat set, if I presented those two dots to you, you have no way of knowing which was the pass and the fail. While they technically do have a difference in contrast, it's so little, there's no way. Meanwhile, the okay, you can probably understand what's happening, and the good is very clear what's happening. The next thing we're going to get into is photosensitivity and photophobia. Now, medically speaking, these are two very different conditions. But when it comes to accessibility and tech, we solve these problems with effectively the same answer. Now, photosensitivity, to differentiate it, that's when you actually have harm caused to the person by dealing with light, whether that's inflammation or seizure or rash, whereas photophobia is an aversion for light. It doesn't actually hurt them, it's just unpleasant. So to give an example of photophobia would be, again, you sit in a movie theater, you watch an entire movie, and you walk outside, and it's just, oh man, it's so bright. It's not actually hurting you, it's just very unpleasant. I'm not going to go through all of these for the sake of time, but there are a number of conditions that have photophobia and photosensitivity. Sometimes photosensitivity is also referred to as light sensitivity, but like for example, migraines, your migraine will actually get worse with exposure to blue range light. Therefore, it is photosensitive. We have epilepsy, ADHD, ADD, where interestingly enough, I didn't realize those were impacted until I started doing this research, but the point is light can be problematic. Again, WCAG. One of the first things to go with this is do not switch between dark and light themes. If your application is going to be using a primarily light theme, keep using a light theme. If your application is going to be using particularly dark theming, stick to the dark theming. Do not switch between them. This is sometimes referred to as flashbanging the user, where they're looking at a dark screen, a dark screen, a dark screen, then they pull up a data table that's bright white, and your user just about turns away from the screen because they've been hit so hard with the bright. Don't do that. It's bad. It'll cause people headaches and all sorts of problems. It's not something you should do. Another thing you can do is a lot of operating systems will expose whatever theme that the individual user has chosen for the operating system, and you should respect that. 
It doesn't mean you have to copy it, but you should respect it. If the user has chosen a dark theme on their desktop, you should make your application use a dark theme. If the user has chosen a light theme with your desktop, you should use a light theme yourself. It doesn't have to be their theme, but it should also be light. Now, this does come a problem for web applications that can't get this information a lot of times, but for desktop and mobile applications, you can and you should respect that. For web applications, some browsers will expose that information to the browser. If it's accessible, grab it and use it. If not, there's not a good answer for you, unfortunately. The next thing I'm going to get into is a little bit outside of what you typically think of with accessibility, which is neurodivergent conditions. Legally speaking, these are recognized as ADA protected disabilities. So you do have to worry about them. In addition, one thing I want to note is while these are legally disabilities, generally speaking, individuals with neurodivergent conditions will either prefer to have be referred to by whatever neurodivergent condition they have or as simply neurodivergent, not as disabled. It's not to the point of quite offensive, but it's unwelcome. And the first one I'm going to go into, which is the most widespread one, generally speaking, from what you hear about is dyslexia. Now, dyslexia, only about 3.7% of the population has been legally diagnosed with, but we estimate at least 20% of the population has dyslexia as a more reserved number. Some statistics I found were proposing as high as 50%. I'm not sure where it actually lies, but the point is it's a lot of people. I also want to point out for individuals with learning disabilities, 80 to 90% of those individuals have dyslexia. They can have other co-occurring learning disabilities, but dyslexia will be among them. So it's a very, very big problem, especially in the education sector. And I include these two other statistics just because I found them interesting is that dyslexia has a common rate of co-occurring with allergies. I don't know why that is, but I found it interesting. It also has commonly co-occurs with attention deficit hyperactive disorder. A lot of neurodivergent conditions will co-occur with other problems. That's just something to be mindful of. Again, WCAG. So let's go into actually what dyslexia is because it is a fairly misunderstood condition. Dyslexia has two other names it's typically known by, and that's reading disorder and reading disability. Now, one thing I want to preface is there is a belief that people with dyslexia are of lower intelligence or other stuff. That is factually incorrect. Generally speaking, people with dyslexia are perfectly normal intelligence. They have perfectly normal vision. They just have a difficulty with reading, writing, and spelling. Now, dyslexia expresses itself in a number of different ways, which is one of the reasons, kind of one of the more tricky ones to actually deal with from an accessibility standpoint. But the two most common ways it presents itself is difficulty associating letters with sounds. That is putting together syllables so that they can actually, you know, mentally get around what words are. There's also a difficulty in matching words together into sentences and paragraphs. And this is where we commonly hear about the idea that using letters that mirror or can rotate to be other letters can create confusion. It's also stuff where words can shift places. And all of these are different ways dyslexia expresses itself but are similarly problematic. Now, one of the things I only recently learned as to help with individuals with dyslexia is to not use white on black or black on white. And it's just by the nature of having those two colors together can make things with like, especially the word replacement kind of situations, far worse than using other color options. Now, I do want to point out, it is okay to use white and black, just not together specifically. Like I don't want a white background on my slides. And the way we work around this is to use stuff like a color that's not quite black or not quite white. Like you'll notice this entire presentation has been done in light tan and a very dark gray that's erring on the point you could count it as black. But as such, it's not going to pose as much of a problem for dyslexia as if I had used a white background. The next thing to do is to make sure you use a dyslexic friendly font. Now I've had countless people ask me, goes, what is the best font for dealing with dyslexia? And the answer is there isn't one, because again, dyslexia expresses itself in many different ways. What font might be really good for one way it's expressed may not be as good for another. And this comes down to, again, respect if the user has gone out of their way to select a font, just use their font if you can. Sometimes you can't because they're using a paid for font and all that, 
but at least use one of these fonts that's fairly dyslexic friendly. And I'm not going to go into all the details of what makes a dyslexic friendly font, because that could be an entire conversation within itself. Um, all these fonts here are generally easy to get a hold of and easy to use. The only exception being the dyslexia font, which is extremely popular for being very effective, but it like costs like $60 just to install on your machine. It is not a cheap font. And there's an example of the, uh, uh, correct itself, the subtitles being rounds, it's thought I said 6,000. The next thing to do is text spacing, formatting, and font size. You wanna have a line spacing of at least 1.5 or more. By having your lines separated, it's less likely they're going to have that confusion between the lines. Uh, use bold for emphasis, avoid underlines and italics, especially italics. And it's not that you can't use them at all, but like if I'm in a big block paragraph and I'm using italics in the middle, you're going to give someone a bad day. With dyslexic friendly fonts that are specifically designed for dyslexia, these are less problematic, but generally, Try to avoid them if you don't need them. Um, break up pages into smaller sections. The biggest problem you deal with with dyslexia is the more of a wall of text you've got, the more of a problem you've got. If you put separations, you break into categories, put imagery in there, all of that helps. Uh, avoid all caps. Not only is all caps considered rude and unpleasant, it's more dyslexic unfriendly. It's harder for them to read. Um, avoid too much text in a single line. Some of my slides in this presentation are examples of what not to do in that, and I should improve on that, but my slides need a little bit more love with imagery as is. That is a problem I need to fix. Um, having taller, narrower columns is better than wider, shorter columns. Uh, bullet points and numbers can be great ways of breaking up blocks of text, where you can have a block of text, several bullet points, block of text, to help make it so it's just not one big thing. Um, use font size of at least 12 or larger. Um, avoid any type of moving text, whether that's flashing, blinking, marquee, uh, you know, whatever, just text should be on your screen. And then follow basic good writing rules in general. Avoid past tense or passive tense, jargon, double negatives, these kind of things. The next one I'm going to go to, and we're getting close to the end here, is autism spectrum disorder. Now, autism spectrum disorder is actually really well we're doing really good so far as like with children getting these numbers right and detecting it at about 1.8%. But when it comes to adults, we are only okay that a lot of our stuff is actually not diagnosed, but estimates. And this because again, in the United States, we do not survey for a lot of these conditions once you reach adulthood. So if it's not detected as a child, it will go undetected for the rest of your life is the most likely outcome. And this can be very problematic for dealing with these things because you can't deal with an undiagnosed problem, WCAG. Uh, again, text spacing, formatting, font size, layout should be consistent. One thing that does become a thing when we're dealing with individuals with autism, more so than the previous ones, is what's called a sensory concern. Basically, the more noise and nonsense and flashing and blinking you have going on a page, the more and more problematic it can become for someone with autism. This is why you want to keep your designs uncluttered and simplistic. That doesn't say you can't have stuff there, like you can have a size, it's just the layout shouldn't be super complicated. Um, another thing that you should do is if there's any type of movement or animation on your page that isn't triggered by the user themselves, the user needs to be able to stop it. This is especially problematic when we're talking about like ad banners, as that can be stress and anxiety inducing and distracting. Even better is to not trigger the animation unless the user clicks on it to go for it themselves. Um, make sure you have very clear separations between your content. If I have an article here and a separate article, I should have a very distinct separation between those, whether it's like a black line across the light colored background, just something to make it very clear where it starts and stops more than just an empty space. Um, and especially avoid time sensitive information like countdowns. The image presented on the bottom, you can already imagine how that works where it says there's a sale, the number counts down. That is extremely anxiety inducing and very unpleasant. It's also a high pressure sales tactic, which even me as someone who doesn't have autism would close that page out of frustration. Don't do it. It's fine to say you have a sale that ends on Friday and it's fine to say there's a day left, but don't have like the animated ticker going down to build all that stress. The next thing is to make sure you communicate clearly. 
do not use ambiguous language such as metaphors, similes, or any form of exaggeration if you can help it. Be very careful when you use sarcasm and jokes. Take the second to go, hey, I was being sarcastic, I was making a joke. Call it out, because these things can be misinterpreted easily. It just helps. Another thing is if you have to use jargon, which is a thing we deal with in tech, make sure you take the time to explain what that jargon means or at a minimum provide a definition of the jargon. It's also very important that anytime you go to use an abbreviation for the first time, you actually provide what that abbreviation means after. Ideally, avoid abbreviations if you can, but because of spacing and all that, that can be a problem. But make sure you don't rely on abbreviations too much. And I'm sure everyone who's ever walked into a place that has all their own abbreviations can understand why this is a helpful thing. I'm sorry, helpful thing for themselves. Now, after that, we have attention, di attention deficit hyperactive disorder. This is another one that's pretty well documented among kids. We have about 10.8% of kids between the ages of 5 to 17 have been diagnosed, but only about 4.4% of adults. Now, one thing when I'm going with these neurodivergent conditions, these aren't things that you get better or that happen later on in life. You either have it or you don't. So we look at the statistic and obviously something seems off. And the problem here is we have a massive underdiagnostic of individuals who have ADHD within adults. And that's because, again, we don't screen for any of these conditions. Someone has to say, I have a problem, go to a doctor and then have it diagnosed. Most of those 4.4% actually came out of diagnosis that happened as children and they have reached adulthood. So this is another place that this problem is probably much worse than it's being presented in the slide. Adhere to WCAG standard. Uh, Text-based formatting, font size, layouts should be consistent, sensory concerns, all that is the same. But on top of that, get to the point. Avoid fluff, asides, tangents, and all sorts of information that isn't relevant to the point you're trying to get around. The more and more noise you have in there, the more and more problematic it can be, not only for people with ADHD, but for people in general. And if you want a good example of what not to do, just do a Google search for a cooking recipe. Half the time when you pull up a website, you're going to learn about the family's like entire history of where this recipe came from, their great-great-grandmother. That's cool. If that's what you're looking to read, that's great. But you're going to lose a lot of people about halfway through. Now, this isn't st strictly dealing with accessibility in the sense that we have been going into is, you know, the various technologies and how to deal with certain accessibility, but it's the hiring practices and policies of your company. And I'm not going to deal with this too deeply because, again, this should be its entire own talk. But when we're looking at statistics and we're talking about bias, especially implicit bias, that is a bias you aren't aware you have, we see that when it comes to disabilities, they are the single group that has the strongest workplace bias against them out of all groups. Um, it comes out to be about 1.3 people have a significant unconscious bias against individuals with disability, which makes it the highest demographic for this. When we're talking about employment of people with disabilities, it's at about 34.9% for 18 to 64 year olds. And when we're talking about regular employment at the time that these statistics were pulled from, it was about 76% for individuals without disabilities, which is a gap of about 41.1%. Obviously, these numbers move around. They do not reflect right this second. But the point is, it's like less than half. It's bad. When you talk about median earnings between individuals with disabilities and individuals without disabilities for the same role and the same general productivity and all that, the gap is over $10,000, and that gap has been widening at an increasing rate over time, which means it's getting worse. When we talk about the number of successful ADA complaints against companies, which this would be a Title I complaint as opposed to Title III, they are increasing at an increasing rate. That is, there are more and more problems that are getting through the court system, and the company is being found at fault. So. The point is, there's a bias here and it's getting worse. And you thought I wouldn't cover the WCAG with this one because you're like, hey, that's not a web technology, but most application systems for applying for jobs nowadays are based on web technology, so it still applies. So adhere to the WCAG.
And when we're talking about bias and hiring practices, the one thing we have to recognize right from the start is there is no such thing as a hiring practice that lacks bias. They all have bias, hard stop, period, no exceptions exist in the world. By the very nature, at the end of the day, you're going to have X number of applicants and you're going to select one. You are going to be screening for the other. There will be some level of bias there. That doesn't necessarily mean you have a hostile or otherwise bias, but there is a bias there. For example, a lot of biases you have in your hiring processes are deliberate and arguably good. If I am hiring a mathematician, I certainly want to screen for people who have good math skills. That is a good bias to have for that specific role. The difficulty we run into, and in these screening processes, we often have to depend on what's known as a proxy measurement. I can't go to someone and say, are you a good developer, and take out a ruler and measure that you're a good developer. I have to go, okay, well, let me go and break out the whiteboard and have them do a code challenge or do a logic problem or whatever other thing. I'm not measuring the actual thing I care about. I'm measuring something that would imply the thing I care about. And the difficulty with doing that is a lot of times you introduce unintended bias along with that. And especially when we're talking the purposes of accessibility, if we go back to that mathematician example, I might have you take an online test that's, you know, addition, subtraction, division, percents, whatever, and turn around because that website is not accessible, while technically I was trying to grade you on your ability to do math, I am also screening you on the ability of you to access that website that is inaccessible. And the thing we can do about this the most when it comes to hiring practice, because again, I'm not going to dig into this to a huge depth, is to challenge your processes regularly. We've established all processes have biases, some which we intend, some we do not. The only way we can correct that bias is if we look at our policies and practices and go, what's wrong, and try and detect that. One way of doing this would be to take a number of applicants you would hire that have different demographics represented, whether that's you know by race, by gender, uh, LGBTQIA, um, people with disabilities, put them against your hiring process and see what happens with the screening. If you look at the other side, you see, wait a second, only like half of the women got through while everyone else got through. That would tell you that your screening process has a very strong bias there, something that needs to be corrected. Now that said, if you go through this process and there's no clear disproportional bias of getting, people getting knocked out, then you could sit there and go, okay, at this moment, we didn't detect a bias. It doesn't mean there isn't one, but that we didn't verify it. All that means is in the future, we would test again, because again, no testing system is perfect. They all have their flaws, they all have their mistakes. But in addition, when we're talking about bias, there are things that could be entirely external to your processes that change what was once a perfectly reasonable process and creates a bias within it due to external factors. So you need to challenge it regularly. And this is all important because you need individuals in your company that represent different demographics because that's the easiest way to start detecting a number of these problems. Because if you have an engineer who has an accessibility problem and they're helping you build a website and then they go, you know, for me with my disability, this website sucks. It's going to be very obvious that you detect a problem. Unfortunately with accessibility concerns are so widespread, so many, and some of them are so infrequent, you're not going to cover all your bases. The point is you want to have a broad representation within all of your teams. So that concludes the part, like the whole talk I've given through here. Um, again, the two points I hope you get out of this more than anything else is accessibility is important and that you should adhere to the WCAG AA level standard or better. Um, you can reach me by email at me at ericjfisher.com. Eric and I also have my Twitter handle there at Eric James Fisher. And I hope you enjoy this presentation. Do you have like, this is open for questions and all that for anyone who would like at this point. Hey, Eric. Hi, this is Joe. Um, can you hear me okay? Uh, yes. Okay. So I, I know that you said you had a couple takeaways that you wanted people to walk away with, but I, the, the takeaway I, I got from listening to this uh, very detailed uh, presentation on accessibility, I, I think this is the, one of the best ones I've ever uh, been to in terms of just, you know, covering a lot of material and, and really making it clear what a widespread issue it is. Um, 
but the one thing I took out of it, I think, is that following these accessibility guidelines isn't just to help people who have issues, but it, it sounded to me like it'll make it a better application for everyone no matter what. Right. It's it's something yeah. that I as a developer would want to do to improve the quality of my application, whether it's really whether I really think of it as an accessibility issue or not. Yes. I actually now I think about it, um the original version I've had of one of the earlier slides that I guess didn't make the cut was um the one of the sayings that the WCAG has so far as its presentation is that accessibility is helpful for everyone, essential for some. But um, that ultimately, anytime you're dealing with a problem where someone who has an accessibility concern can't use an application, that's a sign your application has an accessibility problem completely separate of whatever their disability is, that your application has a shortcoming within itself. And it's just for a subset of users that that difficulty is just too much. Okay. And the other, I just, I, I'm curious, you, you're obviously passionate about this. Where, where did your passion what, what's the uh, genesis of your passion? You know, how did you get started in being so passionate about this? So there's kind of two sides of it. I would say the point that I started becoming particularly passionate about this would be I had worked as one of my earlier software development jobs for the University of Central Florida's uh, engineering college outreach program. Um, and basically what happened with that is we were trying to get underrepresented groups to apply for STEM or not apply, but to pursue STEM degrees and jobs through the University of Central Florida. And this was primarily targeted towards women and underrepresented minorities at the time. And I'm kind of kicking myself now because later on in life, I came to realize how big accessibility was a concern there that we also were failing on at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and then on top of that, I've had a close personal friend who had a brother who had very severe cerebral palsy that was um, kind of locked in at like a mental capacity around eight years old, extremely limited motor function, extremely limited mm -hmm. verbal, as well as my sister-in-law is very cer severe cerebral palsy, the point she is non-vocal. So it's you can barely get if I'm in pain or happy out of that. And it comes to make you realize that there's just that many more people out there who have problems that can be addressed. Now, granted, for her, there's not much we can do, but somebody in between can be helped. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, not so much a, a question, but definitely a comment. Um, you know, the one screen you're talking about not having just one way to do something because it could interfere with a particular disability. I happened to notice this. I was in my car a couple of days ago and I was losing my voice. And the only way to get the Bluetooth audio stream to turn on on my, on my car's stereo system was to go through the talking personal assistant. There's no physical button to push to do that. And I got to thinking, boy, that would be really awful if that was the only way to do it. And I permanently lost that ability to do that, you know? So uh, that example kind of hit home for me and I can see now some of the things that you talked about in that. Yeah, like one of the, there was another talk I've listened to and it's been a long time that the point they were trying to get across is that we all deal with accessibility problems, but they're talking about stuff like, you know, you think about it, it's like, I don't expect to lose an arm at any point in my life. That's just not something on my radar. Now, granted, fate could deem otherwise, but it's not something you go with. But that doesn't mean I could run into an act, wouldn't run into an accessibility where I couldn't use a hand. You know, a common one is if you're a new parent and, you know, your kid's sick, they're fussy, they just want to be held, you can sit there and hold them. Well, now you have to work with one hand and everything. You're not disabled but you're effectively disabled for the purposes of accessibility. You don't have a hand and that happens to everyone. Well, I mean, not specifically the kid thing, but accessibility problems. Yeah, exactly. I have a question. Uh, what uh, tools do you use in terms of like a screen reader and uh, testing for accessibility compliance like for the web? So when it comes to what I've used so far as, as work when it comes to get accessibility concerns, which unfortunately a lot of that falls outside of my department, what I personally run all of my slides through as an author is the Microsoft has a built-in screen reader called Narrator that's okay, it's passable. Um, if you want a true experience of what a proper 
commercial screen reader is, there's JAWS, which is spelled exactly how you think about it. That's far more feature rich, but is a, is a little pricey. Um, generally, I just use the, the narrator one because I kind of want to have the not ideal experience because if I can't make that work, then certainly it's going to be unpleasant for someone else. Um, for testing for like color deficiency, there's actually color filters built into Windows as well. The downside with those ones is they actually don't cover all the different types. So that's the reason I go straight to, to black and white because I can't test everything I want to and black and white covers 99% of the issues. Um, there isn't a good test I've seen so far as dyslexia or a lot of the other problems, unfortunately, due to how they express themselves. You know, about the best you can do with that one is if you have someone with those disabilities in those departments to ask them, but it's it's frowned upon for you to just randomly grab a friend and go, hey, you're dyslexic, do this for me. That's a, that's a no-no. Yeah, thanks, yeah, I've used uh, MVDA and uh, JAWS a little bit uh, for testing. Yeah. And uh, on the, the web, I was using the AXE, um, and then there's like a, a web aim one as well that has like a, a plugin for I think Firefox um, that oh. has for some compliance. Oh, that I totally forgot. There's a um, it's a fairly new Microsoft tool, and I had it installed in this laptop until the hard drive went south like two days ago. Um, there's a Microsoft tool that you can pull in as a plugin for Edge that also works with Chrome and all that. That is a very complete thing. It'll show you the accessibility tree. Um, it doesn't like properly do a screen reader, but it has a number of the WCAG standards built into it that it'll run a check and say, here's the things we think are a problem. Really wish I could remember what the tool is called. I know I've got it bookmarked on the other computer. I'm, I'm sure if you do a search for like Microsoft accessibility tool, it will probably come up quick. Accessibility checker? Maybe. It sounds promising. <laughs> Let's see. Um, yeah, it looks like Microsoft Accessibility Checker. Yeah, that, that pretty simple yeah, name. That, yeah, that's what the one I'm thinking of, because that one, I believe, has an add-on to the browser and a separate downloader for if you want to do desktop application. I don't. I don't think it had a mobile component to it, but I could be wrong. Mobile is really the wild west when it comes to accessibility, unfortunately. But the WCAG does actually very specifically cover mobile as well to help with a lot of it. So at least of knowing what you want to accomplish, even if it doesn't tell you how. Wow, it, uh, just doing a quick glance at it uh, to see if it was the one you were talking about. It also does Microsoft Office, so you can do a accessibility check on your Word document. Nice. I can see where you can make some pretty dyslexia-unfriendly Word documents. So yeah, that's good. There's something that popped in my head. Uh, oh yeah, what screen are you even showing? Yeah, so this is like the actual WCAG, the whole kit and caboodles here. You'd go in. Well, the standards. It's got a really weird organization that's hard to navigate, unfortunately, but every, everything's there. And you have actually websites that try to like summarize what's there as well. I don't have a good example of that, unfortunately. And did we have any other questions, concerns, or anything like that that we wanted to talk about? I think we're good. Awesome. 